Well, today I am so excited. This has been a date that has been on my calendar for weeks, looking forward with great anticipation as to what God is going to do through this conversation that is about to take place. We are grateful today that joining us in our virtual worship experience is none other than gospel great, writer, arranger, composer, singer, minister, Richard Smallwood. The month of May has been designated as National Mental Health Month, where there is an emphasis on mental health and the journeys that people have with mental health, which is real, and then also testimonies of triumph. And today we're grateful to the Lord that we can engage in such a conversation and testimony today with Richard Smallwood. I would like to welcome Richard today as he joins us in our conversation as we worship and give praise to God. Richard, welcome to the virtual worship experience of the Oakwood University Church. Thank you, Pastor. It's a blessing and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we are grateful to the Lord that you're here and I wanna put this plug in right now. When this pandemic is over, you're going to have to come back. You've been here before, but you have to come Absolutely. back live and in person to the Oakwood University Church on the campus of Oakwood University. You have a lot of friends uh, that yes. are part of your journey, of your life, who are from Oakwood. And so you have to come back and share with us. And we're going to talk about some of those friends of Oakwood during this conversation. I want you to know that for me, for my wife, for our family, you are our favorite all-time gospel artist, singer, composer. In fact, my wife and I were talking Thank earlier you. today. She is just as excited as I am, as are our <laughs> daughters. Um, if you worship with us on Saturday, our Sabbath, uh, you recognize that all of our music, all of our responses, Richard Smallwood, a music lover cannot come to our church and leave not knowing that Richard Smallwood and his influence in our worship and music ministry is so impactful. Uh, from uh. the intro, come before his presence, to our prayer <laughs> song, preparation for prayer, healing, or I love the Lord, or we sing now, I trust you. All of it, Richard Smallwood, and we want to say thank you. Shameless plug, uh, almost 30 years ago when I was an undergrad here at Oakwood University, it was Oakwood College then, we have a gospel choir, Dynamic Praise, and one of the songs we used to sing was Sin of My Joy, and I was privileged to sing the lead. I was no Richard Smallwood, but I did my best <laughs> in Jesus' name. So we want oh, you to know it. you have blessed us, you have blessed our ministry, and we are excited that you're with Oakwood University Church and breath of life today. We don't have a lot of time, but we want to talk about your journey. We want to talk about your experience. We want to talk about mental health. A lot of individuals look at you and they say, oh, Richard Smallwood is just great. Richard Smallwood <laughs> is one of means, but they don't know your story. Absolutely. They don't know absolutely. your journey. They don't know your testimony. But the good news is they're about to hear it. And so we Praise want to get God. right into it. And we want you to talk, we want you to be comfortable, and we want you to share. Um, a lot of people don't realize that this year, 2021, is the 25th anniversary of your famous work, your famous piece, Total Praise. And I believe churches, yeah. uh, schools, across not just this nation, but across the world, sing that wonderful piece, and we praise God for you. Let's get Amen. started. People see the great Richard Smallwood now. Tell us about your beginnings. Tell us about your genesis, your humble beginnings. You were born in Atlanta, Georgia, not yes. necessarily reared there, son of a preacher. Tell us about the beginnings of Richard Smallwood. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, my, my family actually is from uh, Durham, North Carolina, but I was born uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, as my stepdad, who was a pastor was called to a church there and I decided to make my uh, appearance <laughs> uh, in Atlanta. And so we were there, I don't even remember, we were there maybe five or six months or something before we moved. But in my early uh, years, we moved around a lot. My stepfather founded different uh, churches in different cities. 
And of course, my mother uh, and myself, I was the only kid uh, who was raised, raised as the only kid. Um, you know, he drug us around where he was going. So uh, we lived in New York. We lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We lived in North Carolina. We lived in New Jersey. We lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, until I moved to D.C. where I am now, well, right outside of D.C. in Maryland, uh, and when I was 10 years old. So from the time I was born to the time I was 10, we were like traveling uh, all over the United States until um, we moved here when I was 10. Okay, so you moved there when you were 10. So your early years as a toddler and growing up were in many different cities. Your stepfather yeah. was a preacher. Uh, now, I'm a preacher's kid, like you're a preacher's kid. And so right. in, in church, preacher's kids, we're literally born in the church, if you will. So tell us right. about church life, what you can remember early on during that period. All I know is church. That's, that is my entire experience is church. Um, uh, when I was probably two or something like that, my mother discovered that um, when they would bring me home from church, I would hum whatever songs they sang at church. So she got me this little uh, baby grand toy blue piano and put it in the crib. And I would hum whatever song, you know, Jesus keep me near the cross or whatever songs we sang at church and bang out the rhythms on the, um, this little toy piano. So she noticed at a very early age that I was musically inclined. And so thank God she did her best to expose me to classical music, all kinds of different the genres of music and that kind of thing. Um, and certainly um, by the time I was probably five, uh, my, my stepdad had a, a, a big upright piano in the house and I would climb up on the bench of the upright piano and start picking out the melodies on the piano. So by the time I was seven, I was playing for his church. I was playing for the senior choir <laughs> and directing and training and teaching parts. And so, you know, what I do, I've never known anything else. I told my mother when I was about four or five, uh, I want to be a gospel singer when I grow up and I need a robe. So she got me this little black uh, choir robe made. And uh, somebody made it for me and I put it on. I'd stand in front of the mirror. I'd sing, I'd play, I'd put on uh, recordings and pretend that I was uh, singing with whatever group was on the recording. And I was a part of, of the Davis sisters or the Roberta Martin singers or whoever. Uh, I was a part of that group. It was just, I, I've been a fanatic about music all my life. And uh, thank God, uh, one of the last things I told her before, before she left us was that I thank God for bringing me through you because you took the time to expose me to music like nobody else that I can even think of. I mean, taking me to classical concerts uh, as well as gospel concerts, uh, uh, exposing me to Broadway music. So all, all of those kinds of genres of music were a part of my growing up. She listened to people like, you know, uh, Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald and, and Nat King Cole. So I'd hear that on the radio. So all of that just sort of colored who I was to become in terms of a musician, in terms of my playing, in terms of my writing. So, uh, you know, God put me with, with, with the right mama. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. The Lord knew what he was doing. Now, oh, yeah. let's unpack that a little bit more. I, I remember reading in your book, you, you said you had a specific moment where you knew that God had created you to do music. And there was a song, you said, Moonlighting in Vermont. Moonlighting in Vermont. Was that song that you had heard. And after hearing it, you know, as a toddler, you knew I knew, yeah. You knew. Okay, so you knew. So now, because you knew, and I want to now weave in, if you will, uh, mental health and whatnot. You knew that because of God's calling on your life and what you were created to do in terms of music, that made you different than your classmates. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Um, where mm-hmm. they may have been into other things, you were good in terms of engaging in music, playing the piano, singing, listening. How was that as a youngster growing up? What was that like for you? In terms of, of my gift? In terms of the fact that your interests, in, instead of, let's say, going out to, to play football in the street, and I'm sure right. you did that, you talked right. about that. But right. in, in terms of your focus on music, your focus on being serious, in, in essence, you were an old man in a young man's body. In yeah. the sense yeah. that you knew what God had called you to do. And so other things that other individuals had done or were doing, you weren't necessarily doing, but you mm-hmm. were focused in on music. How was that? I mean, you know, it, it wasn't really that different because it's all that I knew. It's like, you know, if you grow up in uh, a poor environment, that's really all you know, you know. So you think everybody's like that. So, or if you grew up in a rich environment, you know, you think, oh, everybody has silver spoons and, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. But uh, it was all I knew. I mean, I had, I had a lot of friends, you know, I went outside and played and stuff like that. But of course, I was a klutz <laughs> when it came to sports, you know, basketball and football. Uh, I ran a little bit in high school, but I mean, my whole, uh, um, interest was music if it wasn't music take it away i just was not interested and uh uh, interesting interestingly we lived in paris new jersey for a while and years ago small was singing on the road and i ran into some ladies who had babysat me when i lived in patterson and they said you would come out you know you would come out and speak to everybody but the main thing you would do was sit and play the piano. And she said, you know, we, we could hear you playing the piano from the window. And that's what, you know, my nickname is Buddy. And that's the, they all called me Buddy then. And she was like, that's all Buddy did was play the piano. You know, that's, so that's, that's who we knew. And I was probably then maybe six, something like that. So it, was, it wasn't different to me. Uh, I just didn't have the same interest that, that a lot of my friends had when it came to, you know, extracurricular things in terms of sports and stuff like that, but it was all music for me. So all of my music teachers who taught me when I was in school, I was playing for the choirs, I was playing for the assemblies, I was playing for the special, you know, whatever they had going on in school that day. If they had a piano part to be played, I was there, you know, playing it. So it it, it was a it was it was just it was a, it was as natural to me as breathing. I mean, I, it wasn't like I felt out of place. I always felt I was different. I always felt like I was this kid from another planet. But it never bothered me to the fact because I always seemed to um, have people around me who were interested in music, who liked to sing and and uh, that kind of thing. So um, uh, I, I, it never bothered me. It never bothered me because it's, it's, all, it's all I knew. It's all I knew. And thank God. I didn't have parents who said, well, you need to come over here and do this. They say he likes the piano. He likes the music. Let's buy the records. Let's buy the, let's take him to the concerts. Let's get him a piano, you know, and they just really encouraged me in that, you know, in that vein. Very good. Um, it's interesting when you said buddy, that's what your friends call you. I smiled because that's my nickname. My friends right. and family affects me, know me as buddy. So that was interesting to hear you say that. Now yeah. you, you, you talk of Patterson, New Jersey. In your book, you talk about an experience there where you were having nightmares. Uh, yeah. The door had to be closed uh, in your bedroom. Uh, and you even say to this day, your door has to be closed. Tell us briefly a little mm-hmm. bit about that. Uh, I come from a family that was very, I would say, highly attuned to the supernatural. And this is something that... Uh, my grandfather before me was very highly tuned to that. Uh, my grandmother was, my mother was. And my mother says before I could even talk, we were living somewhere and she said it was a closet door that I would point at and I would say, ah, 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 ah. And she was like, what are you? And she said, I'd be pointing at something. And she was looking, trying to see you know, what, what was it that I saw? And I saw something that she couldn't see. And she said, you should terrify her because I would see things. I would hear things. 
Uh, and in in um, in Patterson, it was this house that uh, is actually a nightmare when I think about it because I, I would see um, uh, what I believe to be spirits. I think there was something wrong with that house, and uh, I would hear people calling my name. It was just crazy, and and I think that you know people who are highly uh, uh, um, exposed or are, are, are gifted in music. Uh, they they sort of maybe operate on a different level okay. than than other folk, you know, and they they're very sensitive. I just I remember one night this this huge huge guy just came in my room. Uh, his eyes were evil, and I started screaming. And my parents got up, started running to my room when they they heard me hollering. And as they start hollering, he started turning to like a gray smoke. And then he just sort of vanished. And my stepdad was looking under the bed. He thought somebody had broken in. And I was just inconsolable, you know. So I've, I've had those kinds of things all my life. Thank God I don't have them as bad as I used to. But I've always very, been very sensitive to the spiritual realm, I should say. Um, and uh, so I had some very uh, frightening experiences, which I talk about in the book, um, you know, throughout my life in that, you know, in that area. In your book, and it's also well documented through other sources, that you have a great love and respect for your mother. But in your book, you also talk about the severe beatings you received yeah. at the hands of your stepfather. Yes. And how that impacted your life and almost in your mind, in addition to what you just described, you experienced throughout your life, but also in your adolescence, how on one side you loved him and on the other side you didn't mm -hmm. because of his uh, behavior and treatment towards you. Um, tell us a little bit about that. It was hard. I mean, from day one, as far back as I can remember, the beating started. And I'm, I've, I've never been a bad child. The only thing, I've always been stubborn. <laughs> always had a stubborn streak. But I was always obedient to, you know, to my parents. And uh, I don't even remember what the beatings were about. Because like I said, I wasn't a bad child. But he, he would find, it seems like, whatever he could to just beat me, you know. And the music uh, became like a cushion or a safe haven where I could run to after those beatings. I had, I had, I had my music, and my mom gave me a teddy bear when I was three that I still have. And that teddy bear was the person I would tell, or the person, or the animal, or the stuffed animal that I would tell about how he beat me. And then once I'd get that out, I'd either put on music um, or I, I would uh, play the piano or because I began to pick up whatever I heard on the radio, I could pick it up and basically play it. So that became my 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 safety, my my shield, my my uh, my protection from the beatings, you know, and the things of that nature. And because of that, um, I started having anxiety issues at very, very early age. As far back as I can remember, I've been anxiety ridden. And of course, we didn't know what anxiety was back then. You know, uh, I just knew I was very anxious, very on edge a lot of the times and, and frightened of him, of course. So there was a, you know, there was a love hate kind of relationship. I mean, I respected him and I loved him because I thought, I didn't know he was my stepfather. I thought he right. was my real father, you know? And uh, I loved him on one hand, but I disliked him intensely on the other hand. So that, 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 uh, that pull was very hard for me to try to figure out as a kid growing up. Okay, so you dealt with the beatings, which is tough for any kid. Uh, you dealt with anxiety. Um, yes. You, you, you were having nightmares. Yeah. But, but you didn't know at that time, and we're going to get to that in a bit, that R Reverend C.L. Franklin, as you, C.L. Smallwood, Smallwood, I'm sorry. I'm thinking, Not a reason that's, that. <laughs> that. People do it all the time, because that's in the book as well. But right. you, you referenced that 
Reverend C.L. Smallwood, as you call him, at that point, you did not know he was your stepfather. I then didn't you find that out. To I was grown when I found that out. Right, right. And we're going to yeah. talk about it in a minute. All right. And then you talk about the elephant in the room. And that is that Reverend C.L. Smallwood had some challenges. Share with those who yeah. are listening what those challenges yeah. were. He was, he was a pedophile. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that, of course, until I probably turned about 10 or 11. And he abused one of my little friends, a young lady who was in, went to my church, who was around my age. And my mother set me down and said, you know, I don't know where this is going to go to, but, you know, it's getting ready to get rough in here. And I, I want you to know what's going on. I don't want you to be caught unaware of what your father is doing. So that's when I found out about his pedophilic kinds of uh, um, leanings that he did. And a lot of them were to some of my, my friends. They were always, as far as I know, they were always female. But, uh, you know, a lot of my friends who were around my age dealt with him doing that. And some that I didn't find out until I was grown, you know. Um, so it, it was... It was um, my mother was the, the spirit that calmed me, that kept me sort of sane in all this sort of turmoil and turbulence that was going on around me as a kid growing up. She was the one that sort of kept everything sane. You know, I, I don't know where I would have been or what would have happened if, I had, if it had not been for her. So you're moving from adolescence, you're moving from junior high and high school, and in 1967 you enroll as a student at Howard University. Yeah. you say in your book that at Howard, these are the best four years of your life. Tell us why. Absolutely. It was the most amazing musical environment that I think I've ever experienced. Here was uh, students in drama, in art, in music. All of them had the same kind of interest that I did uh, and there were amazing, amazing professors there who uh, pushed you. Um, um, none of my uh, uh, professors would let me get away with anything. I had a sight singing teacher by the name of Evelyn Davidson White, who was amazing. She put the fear of God in our hearts. And um, she would give me assignments uh, that were actually made for the next year because I could hear so well. And she knew that if she just gave me the regular assignment, it, it really wasn't a challenge. So she would give me harder stuff, more difficult things to deal with. So all of them, they, they would find out where you were in terms of your capabilities and would uh, give you assignments and things that catered to, to where you were musically. Of course, there were people there like um, Donnie Hathaway, uh, Felicia Rashad, uh, Jesse Norman graduated the year before I got there, uh, Debbie Allen, uh, th who's in my class. Um, there were so many amazing uh, gifts there. Uh, Donnie would uh, set me down to the piano and showed me chords that I'd never heard before. Um, I came from a background where there were certain chords you couldn't play in church. If they were too jazzy or too bluesy, they were, you were, um, uh, you were told that you were being, this was not a club and you could play those kinds of chords, those devil satanic chords in church. And Donnie sort of showed me how to integrate chords that really went your 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 basic gospel chords in my music which not only helped me playing in church but it it, it uh, expanded my chord vocabulary in terms of when I began to write and chords that, that most people didn't use so even some classical kinds of things um so it was an amazing an amazing uh environment um, I decided I was going to party uh, one semester instead of going to class, and that's what I did. And at the end of that semester, Mr., uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Kerr, who was my piano teacher, said, well, you will no longer be a piano major. I was a piano major, and you, you could not come half-stepping if you were a piano major. He said, 
uh, the kind of uh, the, the caliber of student that you have uh, lowered yourself to is not the kind that I will be teaching. So <laughs> you find yourself another major. So I did everything but cry. He said, the only way I will not give you an F, I'll give you an incomplete F. You're going to have to come to summer school for four weeks. You're going to have to learn a complete recital from starting with the Baroque period, the classical period, the Romantic period, and the contemporary period, and learn um, pieces from those particular periods, play them in front of the faculty and the entire student body in the fall of your junior year, and I'll give you an A. And he never had problems out of me again. But, um, you know, I, I tend to be lazy because, you know, my, my teachers when I was growing up would let me get away with a lot of stuff. But at Howard, you could get away with nothing. They, they, they knew your number. They had your number. So uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience that I, that I just look back with a lot of fond memories. Now, a lot of people don't know this, and time won't let us really get into it. But, you know, Richard Smallwood was a social activist, if you will. Uh, skinny guy, big afro. I, yeah. I, I read of the sit-ins at Howard and uh, yeah. being very active in the civil rights movement. I want to say kudos to you for that. Now, you just said that gospel music uh, was not, if you will, supported. I mean, that's what you did. Now, you did classical, you did the other, but yeah, gospel was music was not supported at Howard. Tell us about that. Well, um, you know, Howard, we had the, uh, the late uh, uh, great Dean Warner Lawson, who was a, a, an amazing uh, musician as well as a, uh, a leader uh, in terms of the College of Fine Arts. But um, you can play gospel. All you can play was classical. So uh, we would get down into the practice areas where the piano was and do our little gospel jams. And we'd have a lookout for either the dean or for the, um, one of the custodians who would come and tell on us if we played anything else other than, than classical music. So I knew how to go from Chopin to James Cleveland in five seconds flat. They said, here come the dean and you go right into a Chopin Polonaise or a Prelude or whatever. And then as soon as he passed, go back into Evan Hawkins singers or whoever. <laughs> so we learned how to do that. And actually we took over the fine arts building because we wanted, there were no jazz, uh, there was no jazz departments. Everything was classical, no African-American studies. And so we took over the fine arts building and shut it down for about, uh, I guess about a week until the Dean would hear our complaints about not abolishing classical studies, but, including the studies of our people. And so that's how we got a jazz, that's why we have a jazz department now and we have other you know, departments in terms that are uh, focused upon uh, African-American studies because we took over the building and said, you know, we're not gonna let y'all in to change this curriculum. So yeah, we sat in quite a lot and uh, we took over the A building about some cer certain things in the, in, in the, uh, in, uh, in the uh, entire school. There was some curriculum that we didn't like. Um, there was some leadership we didn't like. So we were very vocal. This was during the 60s. So we would take over and sit in and protest. And so <laughs> that, was, that was part of my, of my learning experience at Howard University. If you saw something that wasn't right, you spoke up about it. Very good. So with gospel music, coupled with you talked about jazz, you wanted that to be taught at Howard University, the School of Music. You wanted uh, to learn more about our composers and arrangers. Very good. And with that, you began to practice that. Specifically, uh, there was a gospel group started there with you and a couple of your friends, classmates, called the Celestials. Tell us about that. Actually, they started before I got there. And as a freshman, Donnie Hathaway actually was their pianist. When I got there, Donnie was there for another semester before he left to do you know what what he did in in in, uh, in the in the in the music industry, and uh, I began to play for the Celestials. It was it was Wesley Boyd, Edward Sully, uh, Daniel Hodge, and later on we added two females, uh, Mary Wilson and uh, Rosalind Tompkins. So 
we start singing gospel on campus. We were the first gospel group actually on campus. Not long after that, uh, after all the turmoil and the unrest and the sit-in, uh, I and, and about nine, maybe five or six other students started the Howard Gospel Choir. We were the founders of the original Howard Gospel Choir. Okay, let me, stop, let me stop you right there. I, I, I promise I won't do this again, but I'm going to stop. Notice, <laughs> I want our listeners and viewers to understand, you said Howard Gospel Choir. And I want everyone to notice, he didn't say Howard University Gospel Choir. He said Howard Gospel Choir. Richard, tell us why. Well, uh, when we started the Gospel Choir, the, 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 the university was horrified. I mean, not only was the, the College of Fine Arts horrified, but the entire university was. And so they did not want uh, gospel uh, attached to the name of the university. So they allowed us to call it the Howard Gospel Choir, which is still called till today. And they, they're doing wonderful. I'm so proud of them. But this was 1969. And listen, we sing for graduation, uh, all kinds of things. And sometimes the professors would get up and walk out when we sang. It was just, uh, we didn't care. It was like, I love music. And I was like, you know, there, there, there is so much wonderful different kinds of genres of music that are out there. So why should I just sing or play just one? You know, so uh, that's how the, that's how Howard's gospel choir started um, with that. Right after we did the uh, set in for uh, Howard uh, for the uh, College of Fine Arts, we started the gospel choir. Had a revival uh, service one night. Had one of the uh, um, guys from the uh, a student who was from the uh, um, School of Divinity to preach, and we had about. 250 or 300 folk in the gospel choir. And, and it was so successful and people started hearing about it that we decided to make it an ongoing thing. So we have the Celestial singing, who was the first gospel choir, I mean, gospel group on Howard's campus. And then we had the, uh, the Howard Gospel Choir. And about two years later, we had the jazz department headed by the late, great Donald Byrd. Uh, and so, I mean, things began to change in terms of, of what we were allowed to do at Howard. We were, we were pretty radical. <laughs> You're radical. You're radical. And, it, and it's amazing. People look at your music, and I'm pretty sure they said, as, as you quoted, that it was contemporary. And now people look at your music, and they say it's traditional. It's traditional, it's, yeah. It's, it's yeah. amazing how things uh, change over time, genres and people's preferences and their perceptions Absolutely. as it relates to the type of music. All right, so we Absolutely. go from the Celestials to Howard Gospel Choir, and now we're starting to see the genesis of the Richard Smallwood Singers. Now, it's interesting because as a kid, you supported, uh, you know, the Davis Sisters. People would name their groups after themselves, the Davis Sisters, the Ward Singers, the Martin Singers. And so now you're getting ready to start the Richard Smallwood Singers. H how does that begin? What's that genesis like? Well, actually, when I was 11, uh, I formed the first Smallwood Singers. We were all like between 11 and 13 years old. At 11 years old, the Richard Smallwood Singers. 11 years old. We had the Richard Smallwood Singers and we sang all around the, uh, uh, the district, Maryland and Virginia area. Um, and we were these little kids, you know, I played the piano, they could really, really sing. And, and uh, that's where it really started. Um, of course, we only stayed together probably until I got to high school and then uh, we, we didn't sing anymore. But when I started the Smallwood, the, the Smallwood Singers, recording Smallwood Singers, actually that was started out of the last church that my stepfather founded, which was Union Temple Baptist Church. Uh, he passed uh, two months after I graduated from Howard undergrad. So he, he, he passed in August. Uh, and we were, th we were without a pastor and I began to get some of the kids at Howard to come over and sing on Sunday mornings and stuff like that. And, uh, the Smallwood Singers was birthed out of that young adult choir that was at Union Temple. So that's how the whole Smallwood Singers, I just, and, and somebody told me, a I had a friend of mine who was an attorney and I was trying to come up with this, some kind of wonderful name, something very biblical or something, she said, call them the small whistling. She says, because you are the brand. You can get five 
dogs from the pound to come and be the small wood singers, but your name will always be out front. And I said, no, I don't want my name. She was like, no, Richard, call them the small wood singers because you're going to be the name. You're going to be the brand. So that's how it really, really started. And, um, you know, the rest in terms of the small wood singers is, is sort of history. That's, that's how it started. Um, in terms of me really getting into the industry uh, and recording and that, and that kind of thing. So Smallwood Singers, uh, they're born, uh, I, was, I should say reborn, if you will. And yes. <laughs> they're traveling across the United States, traveling internationally. Um, you're a blessing to so many people. Uh, your writing, your arranging, your music, your ministry, people are sharing with you their testimonies. But what many people don't know is they think that instantaneously uh, you were receiving great economic or monetary benefits. But <laughs> as you chronicle, you, you share how they were very humble, uh, sleeping on floors in people's homes. In fact, uh, many within our, our faith group, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, don't know, but you referenced that you went to San Diego, California and sang at one of our yeah. churches and you stayed yeah. in the home uh, of one of our former pastors in our church, uh, Elder Shelton Kilby. Elder Kilby, he, exactly. Elder Kilby, he and, and his wife. And, and, tell, us, yeah, tell us about, and, tell the viewers about that musical performance, if you will, at our Seventh-day Adventist Church. T tell us about that. Oh, um, we had known Shelton for, for a while. And so we went to California uh, to get, you know, to sing at some different churches and stuff like that. We, sell, we, we, we slept in sleeping bags on Shelton's uh, and his wife's floor <laughs> in their home. Uh, and he told us uh, th this one particular day, he said, I've got this, this, this uh, church that I want you guys to sing. I'm going to do a workshop. And at the end of the workshop, I want you to do a concert. So um, I must say, um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been one of the biggest supporters that I've ever had. They've always been a huge supporter from the time I started out with the Smallwood Singers. Um, so we, we went to this church, but they were old school. They didn't believe in drums. They didn't believe in gospel music per se. Uh, and so Shelter sort of set it up, the workshop about, you know, praising him on the high sounding cymbals and how David danced his clothes off and, you know, the whole thing and tried to connect it. And there was this one lady who was the, um, she was the uh, minister of music there. And she said, well, I don't want to hear what they do in Africa, Africa, because I'm not from Africa. And so you're not going to bring that junk and those chords and them drums and stuff in here. Because he went about how the drums were imported in Africa and how, you know, all that kind of stuff, slavery. She didn't want to hear it. So he did the, he did the uh, workshop. And then the final night, we come in for the concert. And we bring these drums in the, in the, in the sanctuary. And you hear this audible gasp from the audience. <laughs> and this lady runs up to me, she says, does Pastor know you bring those drums in here? And I said, well, yes, he asked us to bring everything that we use when we do, you know, when we minister. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be really hard. Oh God, have you been in places like that before where they didn't allow really gospel music or a lot of drums or rhythm or guitars or things of that nature. Um, and so we began to sing can't remember what we sang, but one of the songs we sang was one of the songs on our first album called I've Got Something This World Can't Take Away. And when we begin to sing it, I mean, the spirit of God just started moving. Like, you know, you, you feel it moving, you be like, uh-oh. You know, I mean, it just started moving all over the anniversary and, I mean, all over the, uh, the auditorium. And the um, uh, minister of music who had given us all this flat was sitting on the back row with, with I guess, some more of her lady friends. And I just saw her start waving this handkerchief. And so I said, oh my God, she's telling us to sit down, you know, cause she <laughs> don't want, cause people started crying and people started worshiping and raising their hands. And I said, oh, I know she hates this, you know? And so God just came in and just went bow, bow. You know, I was like, wow. And so when we finished, we got through the concert, the, the, the congregation was very receptive. She, she was not receptive. She came up to me, she said, son, come here, son. 
And I said, yes, ma'am. I said, oh, Lord, she won't let us have. She said, where are your albums? I said, well, man, we haven't recorded yet. We just thought, she said, listen, when you get that first album, I want you to call this church and ship some of those albums out here, out, out here to this church because we need to hear that music. You understand? I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so it was another time where God just sort of broke through and, you know, the ministry uh, shone through whatever she thought was going on. And, and we were there for one reason. That was to make a difference through our music, you know, to, to the listeners. And uh, so, you know, we, we've gone through quite a number of situations like that where they didn't allow this kind of music or that kind of music. But because we went to Howard, we were used to that. So it wasn't, it wasn't no big thing. We just pressed on and did what it was that, you know, God had called us to do. Praise the Lord. So we have a lot of titles here that we have been blessed by over the years. Uh, you mentioned one, I've got something this world can't take away. He won't leave you. Of course, I love the Lord. And, and you begin to just write songs. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. And all these songs were ministering to millions of people. But then 25 years ago, it was the song. Yeah. And it was in Atlanta, Georgia. At then, it was called the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit, yeah, yeah. And you were there, and the Richard Smallwood singers, you know, they, we had, they had evolved now to become Vision. Uh -huh. And Vision was with you in Atlanta, in Atlanta. You had talked about it originally having singers from Atlanta and D.C., but then the Spirit of God started speaking to you, and you just started going with those singers from D.C. But you wanted to do this performance in Atlanta, your birthplace. You went yeah. to the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit. You were there. Total Praise debut. A young man by the name of Mervyn Warren, an Oakwood University graduate, son Absolutely. of a preacher. His parents are here in Huntsville now, members of this church. His grandfather was the pastor of this church years ago, chair of our religion department. And Mervyn Warren, I remember very vividly because I'm looking at the DVD right now. <laughs> he, he, he's directing a string ensemble. Oh, yeah, I, I yeah. remember that. I remember that. And then all of a sudden, the lights come on. Vision is on the platform. You are seated at that piano. That's the biggest piano I'd ever seen in my life. The and all door, of a sudden, yeah. All of a sudden, you all start singing, "Lord, I will live." Tell me what's going on in your mind. Tell me about that recording. Tell me about that song. It, 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 was, it was an amazing night. I got to the point with the smallest singers that we were together, I would say maybe 22, 21 years, something like that. And I got to start getting this feeling that it's something else that I need to do. You know, I, I had most of those voices with me for a number of years. And I just felt like I, I was stale. I was in a place where... I needed to create on another level. And God just sort of placed it on my heart to, to put an ensemble together as opposed to just four or five voices. And so um, when I decided to do that, I had just signed with Verity Records. And I was nervous because I was like, okay, everybody knows the small wood singers. They don't know who Vision is. I just, you know, we'd only been together four months. I started rehearsing in D.C. by the time we were ready to record in, in Atlanta. And uh, God gave me this song, you know, uh, called Total Praise. And it was um, it was during a very difficult time in my life. Um, I sort of hinted at it early about the anxiety. But by then, the anxiety has started to going into depression. And I didn't know it. I didn't know what depression was. I just know I was having a lot of, I was having a difficult time in um, not getting out of the bed, sometimes not getting in the shower. I would show up for the engagements, but after that was up, I would just go home and shut myself off from the world. And while that was going on, God gave me this song called Total Praise, which was going to be recorded on this first album, which was called um, Adoration Live in Atlanta. We had known Mervyn, which takes six, takes no, special blend. Right, and right, opened right. up for us, the Smallwood Singers, a number of times. So I knew Mervyn, you know, so I was like, Mervyn, I need this uh, uh, orchestra, orchestra or, or a small string ensemble to do sort of an overture 
to lead me into this first song. And it's really strange because I have never opened up a concert with a slow song. I always open up with something that's up and get you know people up and clap or whatever. But God just sort of uh, laid it in my heart to open up with Total Praise. And when I taught Total Praise at Rehearsal Vision, we had to close rehearsal. I mean, the spirit was so high in there. I said, okay, I'll just see y'all next Monday. We, we just gonna go home, you know? So it was that kind of excitement around the song. And so that night, you know, when I started playing and, and, and Mervyn had gotten the string ensemble together and they started, you know, Lord, I will lift my eyes to the hills. It was just, I can't really put it into words. It was just this feeling all over the order to come. The place was packed, it had rained all day long. I knew nobody was coming. I mean, nobody's coming to this recording. It'll just be me, Vision, the string ensemble, and the band. The place was packed. Tremaine Hawkins had come from, she was down in, somewhere singing down in North Carolina. She had come, just people from all over had come. And when we started to sing it, you know, you could just feel the atmosphere uh, switch. And when we finished it, we went back into it, back into the uh, course, You Are the Source of My Strength. I didn't think I was going to be able to get to the next song because people were just on their feet. People were worshiping. People were praising. And I was like, we got like 12 more songs to do. How are we going to get through this? And I just had to sort of shut it down and lead it to the next song, which I think was Bless the Lord on My Soul. And... uh I had no idea what song that got, uh, or, 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 the, or the, I guess the strength of that song that God had given me. I mean, that song, that's been 25 years ago that it was released. Uh, and um, that song has gone all over the world. Uh, I just give God all the honor and praise. I mean, they sent me um, videos of, of, of choirs from Samoa singing it, from Italy, from Germany. Uh, uh, synagogues have, have sent me tapes of, of their, um, it being a part of their worship um, as a part on Sunday mornings. Um, in every language I think I've almost ever heard, you know, I've got from, from Africa, from everywhere. And so, it just sort of took on a life of its own. And, uh, you know, you think, because by then I'd written, I'd written Sitting My Joy, I'd written Holy Holy, I'd written, I'd written a lot of songs. Um, and so you think that God has done all he's going to do. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not quite finished yet. And he just brought this song out and it just sort of changed. It changed the course of gospel music in a lot of ways. It certainly changed my ministry, you know, um, so it's been, um, it, it was an amazing night. It was an amazing night. That, that's one of the, uh, uh, keynote, uh, nights of, of, of my life that we did, uh, that adoration live in, in Atlanta, because it just sort of changed the whole course of my music. It ushered vision in this new, new group, you know, uh, a lot of them were in their thirties then. Now they're twenty five years young, uh, twenty five years older. <laughs> you know? So it's it's been not, and we're a family. We're very close, uh, and it's been it's been quite a journey, quite a journey. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Well, you you blessed us that night, and you are continuing to bless us with your music ministry. I remember that that concert. Watching it, it was full. You you know you went. From there to bless the Lord. I, I remember that night, Angels. I remember yeah, that night, man, Thank right. You by Sharice Nelson. Uh, yeah. it, it was, it's just, it was a blessing, and it still is a blessing today. And from there, you know, there were other recordings in Detroit. Uh, there, there were other recordings. And then, but I, I want to talk about a specific recording that was going to take place back in D.C. at Jericho City. All right? And, and that's where you ministered to so many uh, with your new song, Anthem of Praise. And, mm -hmm. and you have the ability, God has gifted you with the blend, I want to say, of gospel with orchestration and classical. I mean, it's just a blessing to the body of Christ. But prior to that concert at Jericho City, prior to the release of Anthem of Praise, there was a revelation yeah. That your mother made or shared with you. Now, I need our viewers and listeners to understand that Richard won't say it, but 
by nature, he has been a shy person. Then he's dealing all my with life. all his life. Then he's dealing with anxiety. He says he's a shy person. Now he gets behind the piano, gets behind the mic to sing, something happens. Holy Spirit takes over. But just as a person, he has shared in his book that he's just a shy person. But then if you look at his life, the anxiety, the beatings, dealing with the pedophilia with his stepfather. But now he's about to learn something that would be revealed to him by his mother. Richard, what is that? Yeah, about, I guess it was about maybe three weeks before the recording, my mother just, by then she got, she got pretty ill. Um, she was in her, probably her mid eighties, but she died when she was 90. So she's probably in her early, early to mid eighties. And I guess she finally just wanted to let me know, you know, and she just sort of arbitrarily on a phone call uh, that we were, that we were talking, uh, we were talking on the phone and she said something about Reverend Smallwood and um, and she said, you know, he's not he's not your father. <laughs> I was like, what? She said, he's not your father, Richard. And, and I mean, it just that was probably one of the biggest uh, depression uh, periods that that I went through because it's like everything you think you were or think you are, you're not. Well, who is my father? I mean, you know, I mean, they're, 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 you just go back and think, if I'd have known it then, I wouldn't have let him do, I, I wouldn't have let him beat me like that or something like that. But, you know, God does everything in his own time, and he lets us know, uh, because his timing is perfect. Uh, but it was hard for me to get through that concert. And I remember saying, I just wanted to cancel the concert. I was just like, and this was, you know, uh, Lord, you're my everything. Um, Praise waiting. Um, I, did, I did the uh, the Blessed Assurance uh, piano solo. I did uh, Anthem of Praise. The orchestra was there. Everybody was there. And I was just like, let's shut this down and just go home. I don't want to do it. But it was too, it was too late. And uh, so finally, um, you know, my, 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 I talked to my record label about it. They said, Richie, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And if you see, if you watch that particular video, I was so upset about this whole thing about not knowing who I was. I missed the cue to come out on Anthem of Praise. So, so the, so the orchestra had to do another, like another eight bars or something to get me out there. Cause I was backstage just like sort of going, going crazy, you know, but when I got out there and the energy from the audience sort of met me and all these people just, all this love just sort of hit me in the face. I forgot all about not knowing who my dad was. I forgot all about the depression. And that night was such an amazing night. There were, I think there were about 50,000 people there that night uh, because the overflow was, 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 uh, was packed. Everything, they turned people away. And uh, it was such an amazing night. Um, and that's, but that's when I found out that, you know, Smallwood was my father. Now, the, the other half of my book is searching to who my father was. That's a whole other story that we don't even have time for. Uh, but there were a lot of revelations that, that were made during that search. I found out a lot about my family that I didn't know. I found out I had brothers. <laughs> then I thought I was the only child. I had half brothers. My father had sons uh, who I thought were my cousins. My family had kept a lot of stuff uh, secret from me because they didn't want me to know. So it was just a lot of things that happened. I mean, that, that journey was, was, was a whole kind of other level um, that it, it took me to trying to figure out who I was. Um, and a lot, and you're blessed when you, when you know who your parents are, you know, if they're good or bad. But I just feel like an orphan. I had mama, uh, who my daddy was, you know. So it, it, that's the night, but that's the period that I found out about three weeks from the time that we did that recording. So that recording really stands out to me because I was going through a lot of depression, a lot of uh, sort of mental anguish through that time, you know. Uh, and I had just started going into therapy. 
during that time. And um, therapy is one of the best things that's ever happened to me because it just sort of explained who I was, why I was, why I reacted in certain ways, why did I, I mean, it, it just really opened up my mind to who Richard was. Uh, and it really helped me through um, a really difficult time, times where, I'm not gonna lie, man, we talk about it in the books, there were times where I wanted to take my life and just end it all. I just, I didn't want to live anymore. And it, and it was more than just the, the um, you know, the thing about my father, it was just life in general. I got, got to the place where I couldn't handle stress. I couldn't handle anything. I was just like, I just want to leave it. I just want to, I just want to leave it all and just get away from here. And thank God for those people who prayed for me. And my mom will never stop praying. She, I never told her I went through depression because I didn't want her to take that on as something that was her fault. She was dealing with her, you know, her illnesses and, and that kind of thing and a lot of things in her life. Um, so I never told her, but, but thank God for the friends, for my therapist, for my psychiatrist and so many other people, my, my pastor and, and so many other people who prayed for me and really helped me through a really, really difficult uh, period. And that's why I say, you know, a lot of times uh, we lose, we've lost so many people in the church because we'll say, okay, well, just go up to the altar and pray for about, you know, about an hour. And when you, if you sweat hard enough, depression will go away. And then you get up and you go home and that depression is still there. Reach out for help. It's so important that you reach out for help. Just like God has put uh, uh, heart specialists, cancer specialists, doctors. He's put folk down here who help us with our mental issues. And that's so important. Um, and that's one thing I think we as, as the black community have overlooked because you don't want to talk about it. It used to be when I was coming up, if you had somebody in your family who wasn't quite mentally right, they put them in the attic. You wouldn't see them, you know? So, uh, it, it's been quite a revelation to me and it's, it's given me an opportunity to talk about mental health on many, many different levels, to go to churches, to go to conventions uh, and talk about it, how the point is, is taking, how, the, how it's so important to take care of our mental health as well as take care of our physical health. Yeah, you get your physical, you know, once a year or whatever, but what's going on with your mind? You know, and, and so, um, it, it, it was quite a revelation to that to that period for me, that whole live in D.C. Uh, period. Um, and I, that's when I started going to therapy. Like sometimes I was going two or three times a week. I was so messed up, you know. Um, and, you know, I remember um, I, I came through a very uh, a, a strange situation. My mother had me while she was married to. C.L. Smallwood, but I was not Smallwood's son. So I was reading something um, on the internet the other day about how the fetus takes on whatever anxiety that the mother is feeling, whatever the mother is going through. And I think about how my mother must have felt in the situation that she was in, you know, to, to not go all the way through it, but her family sort of ostracized her in a lot of ways and the church sort of ostracized her in a lot of ways, although a lot of people thought I was Smallwoods, but, but still a lot of people knew. Um, so she went through a lot. And I think a lot of those things that she went through in terms of her mental uh, um, things she went through while she was carrying me, I think it was, it was uh, sort of, I got it while she was carrying me. You know, and so I, when I came out, I had a lot of those issues that she dealt with as well, as well as my own issues piled on top of that. So I was a mess, you know, and, and I think that, like I said before, people who are very, very talented, I, I really, really want to, when I see God, a lot of things I want to ask him, but one of the things I really want to ask him is what is the correlation between mental well-being and extreme talent? What is, what, what is that? I look at Donnie, 
who was schizophrenic and bipolar, who took his life. I look at composers like Tchaikovsky. I look at po composers like Beethoven. I look at, at comedians like Robin Williams. I mean, I, I mean, it's just some kind of connection with that mental, those mental issues with people who are super, super, super gifted. I've seen, I saw it at Howard. I saw it in friends of mine who dealt with it, you know? And so it behooves us to really, really take care of our mental health as, as well, um, because that's a part of this, this, this temporary um, shell that we're living in. Not only to make sure our hearts are beating right and we're eating the right things, but the right things are going in our minds and somebody is, is there to sort of help us sort stuff out when we can. Amen. Uh, you've ministered to a lot of people with your response. And I want to encourage those who are watching, those who are listening. If you have some challenges, depression is real. Amen. Anxiety is real. And, you know, Richard Smallwood has been very transparent with us today because a lot of people would think, oh, he would never deal with this. He's famous artist, famous writer, famous singer. But he's a human being just like you and me. Absolutely. If you're having these challenges, seek help, professional help, if you can, counselor, a psychiatrist, a therapist, a pastor, uh, seek help. We're winding down in our conversation, but uh, we, we go from this point now in your journey. God has blessed you, uh, Grammy Awards, Stellar Awards, Gospel Music Hall of Fame. But then it's coming to the golden and season twilight years of your mother's life, your rock. And you realize that her life is coming to an end. Tell us about that. And that comes on the heels, if you will, of the revelation of who your father, your birth father is. Your yeah. mother is getting ill. What's going on now? Well, um, you know, mama is, is starting so uh, you, you we started seeing you started seeing the first signs of, of some dementia, uh, things that things she would forget. And I remember there was one time I came to see her, and she was like, she looked at me like she wasn't sure who I was, and then she said, "Oh, I thought you were somebody else," you know. So so things like that. Uh, but she never got full dementia, but her mind started to. To, to, to leave her a little bit and uh, she got sicker and sicker, kidney issues, just, you know, she was 90. So um, there were a lot of, of issues in terms of, of her age that she was, she was dealing with. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was hard because mama was like, she was my biggest cheerleader. She was like, every grad, everything I, she graduated from kindergarten, Elementary school, junior high school, high school, Howard went to uh, went to grad school and got my master's of divinity at Howard. She was there for that. Everything, every big concert. She would travel on the road with us when we would be going in the vans, going to North Carolina. She she'd ride shotgun. And I mean, so she was so, so much a part of me. I just could not imagine her not being there. I just couldn't imagine this world being in existence and my mama not being in it, you know? And she started giving me hints and signs to say, okay, get ready to leave here. I remember mean, she told me, uh, she said, listen, the Lord has taken care of me all these many years and he's gonna take care of you the same way he took care of me, you know, and, and things of that nature. But I was sort of in denial and uh, I don't know if I'd wanna go through it again, but I was actually there when she transitioned. Uh, I had gone, to get something to eat. I just, by, by this time she was in a nursing home. I'd gone to get me something to eat and came back. And one of the ladies at the nursing home said, hurry up and get to your mom's room. She's leaving. And I was like, what do you mean she's leaving? She, she said, no, she, she's getting ready to go. And I'd never seen uh, anyone transition in my life before. And especially not my mom. You know, this, this woman who encouraged me, who made sacrifices for me, who, who went without, you know, things to eat and clothing so that I could, I could be, you know, um, so that was hard. And when I got back to the room, I could tell she would, she could, she didn't recognize I was there. Her eyes had sort of sat 
that had sort of set to the to the to the right as she was looking in the corner. And I tried to get in front of her and, and get her to focus on me. And she would she would look straight to me. And so, you know, honestly, I just broke. And the nurse who was there, he came in, a gentleman from Africa, he came in, he said, he said, Mr. Smallwood, he said, this is the most intimate moment you could have with your mama. She ushered you in the world and, and get, understand that this, she left one day after my birthday. She was supposed to leave the day of my birthday, so the doctor said, but she waited because I would have never celebrated my birthday again if <laughs> she didn't see the left of my birthday. Uh, the day after my birthday, she had, you know, she had ushered me in. And he said, now here's a way you can usher out. Sing something to her. Send my joy was her favorite song. And I said, I cannot sing that song, you know. And, my, and one, of my, one of my foster sisters was there. And uh, I just grabbed her hand. And I just started singing Send my joy. I couldn't think of the verse to save my life. So I just kept singing the chorus over and over and over again. I kept looking at her and it looked like she would take a breath. And I think that was it. And then she exhale again and she take another inhale. And I was like, Lord, it felt like hours and hours. And I just kept singing that chorus over and over and over again, holding her hand until she took that last, that last breath. And that was, that was undoubtedly the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with, but undoubtedly. And I've been through some stuff, but that right there, to see my mama go, that 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 was hard. But uh, that was her song. That's the song she loved, and they always say that you know when someone is transitioning, the hearing is the last thing to go. You know, so I know she heard me, and my sister, uh, my foster sister, because my mother had foster kids, and she took in when I was in college. As my foster sister said, how did you sing and not break? I, I was praying because I like if, if I break, it's going to mess up what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to usher her to the other side, you know, and uh, so I made it through till she 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 uh, took, took her last breath. Yeah, it was hard, though. It was hard. It's hard. Praise God. Day by day. You've made it to this point. And yeah. As Christians, we believe in Jesus Christ and we have the blessed hope. One Absolutely. day soon, we'll be united with Jesus and reunited Absolutely. with our loved ones who have fallen asleep in him. Yes, this yes. Has been a, this has been a great conversation. We could go on and on. We have a lot of young people who are watching. Uh, you've experienced challenge in your life, uh, but you kept persevering. You kept going on. Uh, briefly, a quick word of challenge to our young people, students here at Oakwood University, uh, young people here at the Oakwood University Church, and even those who are watching what would be a word of challenge and admonition you give them today? I, think you, I don't think, I know, you have to put God first. If it wasn't for God, I would not be here. I put him first in everything I do. I believe that what I do is what I was purposed to do before I was in my mother's, mother's womb. And through those challenges, God, you know, I don't understand how anybody can go on without him. I mean, he is the only person that has kept me through all he's kept my mind he's kept uh he's kept my my health uh he's he's brought me through dangers that i didn't even see sometimes um so putting him first and 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 trying to find out one of the reasons i try, one of the, one of the things i try to tell people yeah i try to tell young people is that find out your purpose why are you here you're just not here by happenstance you know, God, be, the Bible says that, you know, before you in the womb, I knew who you were. I knew you. So that says to me that before we were born, we were with God. We were on a spiritual plane with him somewhere. Try to find out as you as you go through this life, before you go on to your next journey, what are you here for? Treat people right. If you got a, if you've got a, a gift it's not because you were so wonderful. You can always find something better than someone better than you are. <laughs> Listen, there's some talent out here. There's some gifts out here that are mind blowing. But don't try to. The reason that you have your gift is to make a difference in other people's lives, not to hold it selfishly. And say, oh, look what I can do. I'm not going to teach you that because only I can do this. No, that's what we're here. We're here to share. We're here to love. We're here to encourage. Try to love as much as you can. Try to try try to teach. Try to um, 
Try to make a difference to whatever purpose you're here, whether it's a doctor, whatever it is. It's ministry. Doctoring is a ministry. That's that. Listen, that's ministry. Dealing with your mind. Someone who, who has a, a gift in, in dealing with with, with uh, psychology, uh, psychi- psychiatric issues. That's uh, that's a gift. That's a ministry. So everything we do here is a ministry because it's to help other people. So I would just say find your ministry and, and stick with it. Get around people that can encourage you um, and that will lift you up in, 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 in whatever kind of season you find yourself in. And prayer. Keep praying. Keep asking your pastors and, and your leaders and, and, and your family. Because nobody can play like a, pray like a praying family. You know, get, get those, those mothers and those, those grandmothers to pray and to encourage you, you know, and to stay on the road and keeping God first. That's, that's the best thing I can tell you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, you have some good news to share. Um, one of your classmates, one of your friends, uh, Felicia Rashad, uh, there's some good news about her. In fact, she wrote the foreword to your book. Uh, to my book, yeah. To your autobiography, Total Praise. But tell us some good news right now. It was just announced this morning that Felicia is going to be the new dean of the College of Fine Arts at Howard University. So she and I had talked not long ago about some things that we saw that could take us back to that golden age where we graduated, you know, some some curriculum stuff. And uh, so to hear that she was... uh, um, appointed this morning just did my heart good so i'm looking for even greater things at howard university and taking us back to where we used to be uh and and, and producing the kind of students and the kind of artists and the kind of minds that were produced when uh you know we came through then of course there have been some like the, the late amazing amazing chadwick bozeman who came through howard university as well you know so there's there've always been wonderful minds and, and wonderful gifts that have come through there but i'm so i'm so excited about Felicia being there because i think she can direct us to that next level where we need to be that sounds great and please please share our congratulations to her as well what's on we'll the horizon in the near future for richard smallwood because i don't think god's done with you yet what's what's on the horizon <laughs> Well, you know, right now I have really been focusing on the book. Um, we started, actually, we started a book tour right before the pandemic hit. I mean, I was on my way, I was getting ready to go on a plane to go to Atlanta. And they called me and said, everything is canceled. Go in your house, lock the door, don't come out, <laughs> you know. So the middle of the, the beginning of the book tour was canceled. I want to get back to that and share my my uh my book and my ministry and what i've learned and my wisdom with people all over the country um that's that that's what i want to do um it's been a hard year two years almost you know 2020 and 2021 has been really really difficult seeing the uh the 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 injustice um, for so many of our African American men and women and young boys and, and young girls, has been difficult. And you know, people keep asking me, "So you got to write? Have you written something that that uh, that deals with this?" And I'm like, you know what? I'm just sort of sitting, taking it all in, um, and I'm going to see what God does. I know there's there's some music that I started some music before the pandemic started. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I think I'm sort of ready to sort of get in the studio and do a little something, something. But we, <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. Well, let me just say yeah. this. And I can't order your life. But you say you're, you want to share your wisdom and your book and your ministry with others. Yeah. Put Oakwood University Church, Huntsville, Alabama, on that list of cities Absolutely. that you will you know, go you, to. You, got, you guys are my favorite. I, all right, I, I'm I've been coming to, to that. Oakwood for so long. And so I can't wait to get back. That that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, we are going to hold you to that. We're looking forward to it. Uh, come down to Huntsville, Alabama, when things open up fully and uh, they're more safe, if you will. Uh, yes. You know, we want you to come down and share your ministry, share your book, and just come see the people. And, you know, maybe you can sing Total Praise. Maybe you can sing Center of My Joy. Maybe Anthony <laughs> Praise. Maybe he won't leave you. I trust you. And I could go on and on. <laughs> but we enjoy your ministry and we've enjoyed our conversation 
with you today on behalf of myself. Thank you so much. My wife, Danielle, our three daughters, our pastoral staff, our church membership, our entire Oakwood University Church family, the Breath of Life family, and the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Know that you have friends at Oakwood University and Oakwood University Church. Know that you have friends in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And we are looking forward to seeing you in person very, very soon. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful event, and I'm just so glad that you guys invited me, and I love you guys so much. Look forward to seeing you real soon. Thank you very much. Well, you've heard it. Richard Smallwood himself, we thank the Lord for this time that we've had to be able to share in conversation. Again, May is National Mental Health Month. If you need help, get help, and don't be ashamed to get help. In commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the song by Richard Smallwood, Total Praise, also in praise to our God, we are grateful today that our Minister of Music, Dr. Jason Ferdinand, who is also Director of Choral Activities and the Chair of the Department of Music at Oakwood University, and a former staff member of Metropolitan Baptist Church there in Washington, D.C., where Richard Smallwood is an artist in residence. They work together there. He and our team of musicians here at the Oakwood University Church have put together a tribute to the ministry of Richard Smallwood, as well as praise to our God. They're going to engage in this musical rendition, and joining them is also guest singer and soloist Stevie Mackey, along with string ensemble and vocal ensemble. After they would have shared their music ministry, yours truly will return and we will preach the word of God. But now, let's give God our total praise.
You're the center of my joy And all that's good and perfect comes from you You're the heart of my contentment And the hope for all I do Jesus, you're the center of my joy. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and the light. When nights are long and cold, You are the laughter that shadows all my fears. And when I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Simple little things in life You're the music In the meadows And the street Oh, the voices Of all the children My family and my home You're the source and the finisher Yeah. 